Hi everybody, this is Dr. Flight. I hope you are all doing well. Uh, thank you for taking a listen to this uh, lecture. This is going to be an introduction to um, marketing channels and some supply chain ideas. And so again, this is an introduction where we're going to talk a little bit about um, the development and the management of a supply chain and specifically channel partners within the supply chain. So uh, to move right along, then let's talk a little bit about uh, what multi-firm marketing uh, means and what a channel is all about. And so at first, what I'd like you to do is think about all the different activities that need to be done in order for a uh, product to come to market. And so uh, think about um, everything that would be involved from the raw material stage to actually producing the product delivering the product and getting it sold. And if we put together a list of these items, we could go on and on and on for a very long time talking about all the different things that have to be done for a product to get to market. So, you know, on the screen here are just a few of the activities that are done. Some of these are done within the marketing area, but most activities are done outside the marketing area. And in fact, most activities are actually done outside of the firm who produces the product. Um, so if you think about like all these activities that have to be done, we ask ourselves who's going to do them and who is best equipped to do all of these different activities. And when we t put together all the different organizations and firms and companies that we um, that, that that we associate with. In, in the process of bringing a product to market, that group of, 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 of businesses, that group of partners, if you will, make up the collective channel of distribution and, and upstream the, the supply chain uh, where we get our raw materials and, and things of that from. So what I wanna think about is um, as we bring a product to market, think about the activities that we can do but then also think of the activities that we can't do that we reply, we reply upon others for um, within our relationship uh, network. Um, that relationship network is what will make up what we call the value chain or, um, or an extended idea of the, uh, the supply chain. So Michael Porter came together with an idea called the value chain. And basically the idea here is the value chain portray portrays um, a collection of activities that are done um, in order to design, produce, market, deliver, and support products. So um, if one of the goals and of the organization is to bring uh, a product to market so it satisfies a market's need or want, then it has to organize all the activities that, that we just looked at before. Um, and everybody who plays a role in producing the product and bring the product to market has some value that they bring to the table as a result. So that is the kind of the idea of the value chain, which we're gonna expand on a little bit more here in a second. A couple other terms to think about. The supply chain then is all the organizations that are involved in supplying the firm the members of its channels of distribution and the end user uh, with uh, products and services. And then finally, supply chain management is the coordination of value adding uh, flows or value adding activities uh, between supply chain members and, and different companies to help maximize the overall value delivered for a profit uh, to the to the customer. So um, so the idea then is we're going to take a collection of organizations. We're going to manage them and coordinate their activities to create value uh, and bring that value to the marketplace. If we look at Porter's five or Porter's um, value chain model, it, it's depicted in a in a picture just like this, where if we look at the at the bottom area right in here, we're going to see five different 
um, activities that are coordinated. So there's inbound logistics, which would be bringing in raw materials and, um, and, and supplies and things of that nature. Operations, which might be processes that are done to raw materials or maybe uh, done to create value. So works in progress. We think of, of, the, of the transition or the transformation of raw materials into a product. We have outbound logistics, and this may include store, storing and warehousing. It may include delivery and distribution. Um, things of that nature. We have the building of awareness, the marketing, the identification of, um, of, of customers, the sales aspect, the retailing, and then finally we have service. These are the five main primary functions for um, uh, the, the supply chain according to Michael Porter. There are also four support or secondary activities one including the firm structure or the cultural elements and the hierarchy and organization of the firm, human resources, research development and technology, and then procurement, which may include uh, ancillary services that are performed that are outside of direct operations. These support activities are thought to happen all the time, and then the primary activities tend to happen in some type of a sequential order. Now, uh, you know, this, this model, Porter's value chain, um, is uh, important uh, because it, it kind of describes this idea that everybody who plays a role in bringing the product to market does something to create some dollar amount or some value to the end user. So this margin we see at the very end is what's created as a result of the coordinated efforts of a lot of different firms doing these activities. Um, so, so that's kind of where the value comes in as we look to move forward. A couple of things to remember as we look at this, this uh, model here. Members within the supply chain who are purportedly within the value chain only exists if they add value to the final product in some way. If another supply chain member or another organization can perform the same job, um, then what happens is the uh, original um, uh, supplier of that labor or supplier of that, of that purpose um, will feel pressure to either improve, to lower their costs, to uh, do things better, or actually leave the supply chain. Um, so that happens um, you know, from time to time where supply chains are collapsed or, or made smaller as supply chain members leave and existing supply chains take over their job within, within the, within the uh, network of, of organizations. Um, so specifically, this concept is called disintermediation or the shortening or collapsing of a marketing channel. When one or more um, channel members uh, leaves the, uh, the supply chain that uh, it moves forward. This adds to this idea that everybody within the, um, within, the within the channel then adds value. If they don't add value, they're pressured to leave or they're, they you know, kind of experience conflict within the supply chain that has to be resolved or managed later on. Um, one final note is that in recent years in marketing, the idea that the customer themselves creates value has been adopted as well. This is generally kind of this idea of value co-creation. And so basically what we wanna say is that the customer can also create value when they use the product or service that's being produced. And more specifically, that value really doesn't exist until the customer actually does use the product or service. So that's one final note to think about as we move forward. Our objective then, or what we want to think about as we kind of do supply chain or channel management is number one, we want to think about how the supply chain is designed 
and how that design should work within the industry that I'm uh, working within. Um, how does it move from uh, raw production or raw materials to the actual customer who's going to be involved with that? Um, and how is it designed specifically like that? Then finally, we want to focus on managing the supply chain, creating policies to help ensure that supply chain members do what they're supposed to do uh, to the best of their ability. So what we'll see are four different um, objectives that we have, um, you know, when we kind of think about this whole supply chain um, management concept. One is we want to be able to manage the actual physical flow and availability of the product to the customer. We want to get the product to the customer to, through the right retailers. Uh, we want to be able to use our retailers effectively if that's what we're going to do whether it's online or not and just thinking about availability we want to physically get the product moved um, so this might be the outbound logistics and the marketing and sales concepts importers um, uh, value value uh, model that we saw earlier um, another thing that is kind of one of the outcomes but also one of the things that we want to you know kind of measure objectively is customer satisfaction action within the service needs so things like installing repairing after product use or after purchase use and reverse logistics which might include bringing the product back up through through the supply chain with uh, with a return type of a policy uh, we also want to think about product promotion and how our partners can um, build awareness for our brand we want to motivate retailers and we want to have effective point of purchase uh, you know, kind of elements that are available to us. And we also need to manage the flow of information that happens between um, the producers and the market, but then also from the market up to the producers as well. That's exceedingly important um, in terms of being able to gather market data and being able to understand what we're doing right versus what we're doing wrong and what the customers like or don't like within our, with our products. So managing marketing information flow is super, super important. So these are kind of objectives we wanna measure um, that supply chain management helps us kind of think about from a very broad perspective. We can narrow this a little bit more um, specifically and look at specific results that we're going to uh, be as outcomes um, when objectives like these are met. So one, obviously the increased availability of products and goods to the customer is going to be something that we'll see because that's one of our objectives that we have. Um, better customer satisfaction encouraged promotional push so again what we're going to do is we're going to leverage our, um, our our partners to also promote our product and to push our product um, onto the customer and we'll be able to see that as a result of what we're doing and also finally or in addition um, again a flow of information between the firm and the market and the market in the firm additionally we're going to observe a cost effectiveness. So in other words, um, as we do our operations, we're going to see um, that the, the that our costs will go down to do business and the process cost of producing units of good will go down because our partners are taking on more um, active roles in uh, bringing the product to market and we're also forming better relationships with them. Um, this will also allow us or better management of our supply chain also creates more flexibility. It allows our firm to be more nimble. So if we had to change and react quickly to market forces, a uh, good well-managed supply chain allows us to do that. Uh, it leads to a competitive advantage. So if we are managing our supply chain better than our um, competitors, then we'll be able to gain an advantage over them. So that's actually a big, big, big deal. And then finally, a reduced amount of risk that we expose ourselves to if we have a failed product or a failed market uh, product launch of some type. We're not the only ones suffering that loss. There are others in the supply chain that are too. So again, their motive and their incentive is to um, is, is to work with us and work together to um, 
produce a good product and bring a good product to market. So um, these are eight really important concepts um, when it comes to why we want to manage our supply chain and what we expect um, to get out of our supply chain as we actively manage it. So number one, our focus is we're choosing the design of our supply chain to achieve these eight items, but then also we're managing our supply chain to choose the, to, 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 to focus on these eight items as well. So um, supply chain management then has a lot of different nuances and elements to do it. There's a whole course in supply chain management, and, and there are actually um, little mini certificates and degrees in supply chain management. So it's a really big area. It's not small, and it's not limited to marketing, of course. A lot of supply chain and, and uh, channel management concepts come from management and specifically come out of operations management. So this is not a, a small area and can certainly not be covered uh, adequately in a couple different lectures, but uh, the fundamental idea of place utility it, you know, kind of roots itself in marketing and then finally uh, kind of takes over in terms of you know, kind of where it is uh, in terms of the um, you know, role in marketing and kind of one of the four Ps. So as we move forward, anyways, I um, want to talk a little bit about um, managing and controlling the supply chain. So one way that we think about managing and controlling the supply chain is something called a vertical marketing system, or just in general, a marketing system is when a group of firms come together to work towards a collective goal or something in common. So um, in our literature, we've talked about marketing systems, and specifically, we talk about vertical marketing systems as opposed to horizontal ones, where one member of the supply chain will exert pressure or control over other members of the supply chain. And so when one member of the supply chain acts as a channel leader or the, or the, um, the 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 uh, the pioneer the chief of the of the of the system, they will look to manage and and pr produce some type of pressure or force or power on the other channel members. Um, so some ways that marketing systems emerge um, are either through corporate, contractual, or administered virtual marketing systems. A corporate virtual marketing system is when a channel member has an invested um, uh, component in other members of the supply chain. So they may actually buy or uh, purchase a supply chain member who is either upstream or downstream. So we sometimes call this a backward or forward vertical integration. Um, if one company buys the this the, the a channel member that's either upstream or downstream. A contractual VMS is one where we use a contract of some sort to control the behavior of other members within the channel channel organization. So the um, the classic example of of the contractual VMS is a franchise franchise or franchisee kind of relationship where one channel member. Um, has, a, has a contract to behave very specifically toward another channel member. Administered VMSs are more loosely developed or formed, um, but they can include um, things where, um, where uh, the, just the sheer size or the power of one channel member makes them the, the boss or makes them the controller. Um, and so, um, you know, by virtue of being in, say, for instance, Walmart's um, uh, channel, channel, you know, kind of organization, like Walmart's so big, they exert so much power, they tend to be sort of the boss of that channel. Um, and they administer the rules and the regulations associated with their channel. And so if you want to be a part of their channel, if you want your products located in Walmart, you kind of have to, you know, obey what they want or follow what they want in order to be, be part, of, part of what they're doing. 
Okay, so this kind of leads to this idea that when we do VMSs or when we have a channel captain who's the boss, um, then um, we're, we're really focused on two ideas. One is channel power, and then the other is going to be channel conflict. So channel power then is the degree in which any single member of the marketing channel can and does exercise power or influence over other channel members. Conflict happens when we have disagreements among members in the supply chain and the relationship that they have becomes strained um, or maybe even falls apart as a result of that tension or that uh, disagreement that they're that they're having. So the idea then of channel channel power um, is, is something that we'll look at a little bit more. There's actually different forms of power um, that are that are um, you know offered here. Coercive power is power when an implicit or explicit threat um, that the channel captain can make uh, in order to impose some type of consequences on channel members if they don't if they don't uh, obey or they don't um, you know, come come through with with what they're supposed to do. So when the channel captain then makes threats um, that will either impair the um, the recipients or the other channel members' uh, ability to do business or their profit margin or share or something to that effect, um, they'll force um, they'll force channel members to behave. Reward power is very different, uh, where reward power occurs when um, a firm can't bypass a channel um, and uh, where there'll be conflict involved. Um, and this is that Walmart example. So Walmart, you know, again, it's kind of one of these things where if you want to be in that channel, you have to obey Walmart. Uh, because the benefits of being in that channel are so good. So here, um, behavior is um, influenced by the reward that the members are getting. So if I want the huge market presence that Walmart uh, offers, like the huge volume of sales that that Walmart offers, I need. If I want that reward, I need to obey and and follow their rules. So it's not so much that there that Walmart is is saying um, you know is is making me do it, but if I want the benefits that they're willing to offer me, then I have to obey them and kind of follow what what their expectations are. Um, expert power. So this is a, this is a one where uh, we want to be in a in a particular channel because somebody in that channel is uh, viewed as um, the best or a, a leader um, or something to that something to that effect. So uh, channel members again, um, you know, they're they're using some type of like they're the best at doing something, um, and I want to be part of that channel because they're the best. And uh, having them aligned with me uh, gives me more credibility or something something to that effect. Uh, referent power or referent powers when channel members respected, admired, or revered based on a number of different attributes. Um, we That's obviously a, a good type of thing that we want to be able to uh, be, be able to have um, with, with referent power then. And then finally, legitimate power. Um, is one that's contract based, that's more uh, from a legal perspective. One member has to obey another member in order for that, um, that, that process to work. So um, again, uh, lots of different power dynamics here. Your textbook uh, goes over these in detail, so you should take a look at those and specifically um, and uh, learn a little bit more through, through that. Um, two more concepts that we're going to walk through that you may be familiar with because you often see this in uh, principles of marketing type of a class. We're going to talk about push and pull strategies. And so push and pull strategies are sometimes um, uh, dealt with and kind of worked through in promotions management. But you can also look at them in um, here in supply chain as well. So 
we want to stimulate demand for our product. And if we have a strong um, supply chain, then we can use a push method. So in a push method, we involve producers who stimulate the middlemen or the intermediaries to help bring the product to market. Um, so what we want to do is we're going to give channel members like our retailers and our wholesalers and our distributors, we want to give them incentives to take on more product. And moreover, we want to give them incentives to push their product onto the customer. Um, so um, they're going to promote our product more as opposed to less. Um, we want to give them incentives again to, um, to take on more product, to buy more product um, in order for the product to flow at a higher rate through the supply chain. So this is really, you can engage in a push strategy then. Again, if you have a strong relationship and you have a lot of control over your downstream supply chain members. So that's an outcome then of the relationship you have with them and how you're managing those, those members that you have. The um, other strategy that we often talk about if we are talking about a push strategy is the pull strategy where we stimulate demand and we do advertising and promotions directly with the uh, customer or the end user. So um, oftentimes we'll go directly to the customer and we'll encourage the customer to buy our product. The pro customer then comes into the market um, and into the retail locations and they ask for and demand our product. And so product sales are then stimulated or motivated and generated at the consumer level um, and not necessarily through the acts of your supply chain members. So customers want the product more and they end up going to the retailers who then buy more of your product to satisfy, satisfy demand. So that's a push and pull strategy. And here graphically is, uh, are, are these two strategies um, where uh, you can see sort of the general direction of um, you know, of, of motivation where we're going from left to right in a push strategy and we're, we're specifically using channel members to uh, push our product onto the end users. In a pull strategy, demand is coming from the end user first, who then asks for and demands, um, you know, greater, greater product from our channel members. Um, directly. So the push strategy, though, is something that you can engage in if you have strong inter-channel relationships um, and you're managing your supply chain well, and maybe that if you have a lot of uh, power uh, within the supply chain. The pull strategy is used primarily using promotions and advertising, you know, as a, as a tool to uh, generate interest for your product with the end user. So the two strategies are actually results of two very different underlying concepts with within marketing and where your strengths might be. If you don't have particularly strong um, de demand or strong relationships with your customer, with your with your supply chain members, uh, like and you're not managing your supply chain well, or maybe you don't have a lot of power in your supply chain, you're probably going to use a pull strategy. Um, otherwise, you'll use a push strategy to try to generate interest for your for your product. Okay, so this wraps this up. Um, we've spent a little bit of time introducing the concept of supply chain, supply chain management, just as, again, as an introduction. We talked about um, Porter's um, value chain model and different various outcomes that we want to achieve as a result of a well-developed supply chain and channel design. All right, thanks. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and uh, appreciate you listening.